questions are important because they're the basis of thought. And I love questions because they encourage thinking. Questions allow us to develop. Questions are even more important if they are from God. Then we should really be paying attention. And if it's the very first question God ever asks humankind, then we should certainly take it seriously. So here's a question. What is the very first question God asks humankind? Think about it. Got it? Oh, here it is. It's recorded back in Genesis 3 verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? The very first question ever asked of humankind by God is, where are you? This is going to be the opening question of a series of questions by God in the first recorded conversation he has with us. And it begins with, where are you? The most fundamental question with huge implications. God obviously knew where Adam and Eve were. This question wasn't for, for his sake, but for theirs. So what had God done? He, he had created a planet to be inhabited. He, he had planted a garden for Adam and Eve to live in. He had given them a purpose to be fruitful and multiply. Yet despite all of this, they've chosen a different path, a path of sin and self-destruction. Yet here is God, and he's searching for them. This is the archetype prodigal son story, the father searching for a lost child. And he asks them and us, where are you? And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now that word cool is ruach, it's, it's wind or spirit. They, they're hiding literally from his spirit. Now firstly, we cannot hide from God. He sees everything we do. He sees all that we do, even if we would hide. Secondly, our attitude reveals how we see God, hard or loving, and this determines how God responds to us, as we learn later in Jesus' parable of the talents. And thirdly, God seeks us to save us, not to harm us. We read in Leviticus, I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. So this is our story, our life, our question. We were all hiding and may still be hiding, ashamed and afraid. And the sound we hear in our lives is the spirit blowing to bring rebirth. And God asks the question, where are you? It's the most fundamental question we can be asked because it impacts our whole life. Our belief, what we think, our behavior, what we do are impacted by where we are physically and mentally. Physically being in the wrong place will impact what we think and do. Also mentally going to the wrong place will impact what we think and do. As Isaiah says, let the wicked forsake their ways, what you do, and the righteous their thoughts, what you think. Let them turn to the Lord where you are, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. And God says here, behavior and thought are linked, and they are key to both where we spend our time and the right place is with God. As Romans says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The answer to this very first question, where are you, has never been more important than it is at the moment. I may be physically sitting in church or at home or at work, but that does not mean I'm mentally in church or at home or at work. Never before. Have we had a place we could mentally be at any time and would also crave to be as we have today? Never before have we had a place we could mentally be with others at the same time as we have today. It's the world most visit most of the time. It's the world wide web. Now, I'm certainly not against technology, obviously. Social media, etc. is core to my research, is core to my job and what I teach. It's the most useful tool we've ever invented. However, unlike other tools humans have made, the web is not just a tool, it's also a place. And this is where the danger lies. It's a place we can mentally spend time with others, those we know, those we don't know, and the one that is unseen yet sees all. Unlike other tools humans have invented, the web is both a tool and a destination. A drill is a, is a useful tool, we use it, but we don't visit it. A car is a useful tool, we use it. We could visit places with it, but we don't crave to visit the car. Well, most people don't. However, the web is different. We can use it to edit a photo or find a recipe. 
but more often we visit it. We enter into a world where we engage, we speak and type, we read and watch, we visit places and friends, we chat and play. We do nearly everything we can do in the physical world, but we do it mentally, physically. We haven't gone anywhere. But there is another aspect to this world that we visit, and that is the unseen that sees all. And I'm not talking about God. It's the artificial intelligent algorithms which monitor and control everything. Who we meet and what we see and hear is carefully guided for one purpose, to draw us in to spend more time. We're being guided by an intelligence far greater than ours, but unlike God, this intelligence is artificial and has no moral code. It is only one goal to make sure the answer to the question, where are you, is one consistent answer online and it's working. Research shows that we're spending about seven hours a day online. Just take a look at your phone and the screen time and you'll be surprised at how much time we are spending drawn into this world. Never before has the where are you question be more relevant. There is a competition for our mind because what we believe and how we behave are determined by where we are. Quite simply, our attention is worth money and power. The more time we spend somewhere, the more we can be influenced to believe things and do things whether it's to buy items or to influence us to behave in a certain way, like voting or protesting, where we are determines who we're with and what we ultimately do. Proverbs warns us, do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. Or Paul just puts it really succinctly, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. It's a process. The more time we spend in a place with people, the more we begin to become like those people. It's quite natural. The psalmist puts it like this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Do you notice the process? We walk, then we stop and stand, and finally we're seated with those we spend time with. It's a process and a progression. If you don't think where you are spending your time is actually influencing you, then let's run a little self-diagnostic. And there are two easy ones that you can run that give a little insight into your brain's coding and, and actually who is coding us. Ecclesiastes 5 says this, for a dream comes through much activity. Now dreams are a result of the things that we are busy with. What we are watching, reading, hearing will influence our dreams. And it's an interesting insight into our subconscious code and, and what's happening there. G'day, mate. Why is it? Our accents and our lingo are impacted by where we live. The, the language we speak, our culture, are impacted by where we live. And that's exactly what Jesus says. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Take a look at what you talk about, not just while you're at church, but maybe while you're relaxing. This is an insight into what is in our heart and mind. And by seeing that, we can see where we are spending our time and who is filling our mind. Is it God or is it others? Jesus tells us clearly where we should be. He says to us in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. He wants us to spend all our time with him. If we are attached to the vine, we're always with the vine, whether we are anywhere else physically and so we are all given the choice physically and mentally where will we spend our time and the decision we make will impact us in the most significant ways possible as the father has loved me says jesus so i loved you now remain in my love as the spirit of god walked through the garden adam and eve hid but rather paul says no walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk with God, not with the world, and our accent and our actions will reflect God. Let's think carefully where we spend our time. There's one thing we all have equally, rich and poor, old and young, and it's the number of hours in a day. The choice we have is where we choose to spend that time. I want to finish with a, a short but well-known story from Luke. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Maybe she was online. And she came to him and asked, Lord, 
Don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one, and Mary has chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her. The Lord God called to the man, where are you? Will you choose what is better? <laughs>